Let's begin our worship then with a word of prayer. Lord God, we give you thanks that you have made us to be free, that you have made us to be liberated from, from all that would weigh us down. Let us live that good news. Let us give you thanks and praise your name for the ways that you have delivered us and help us to walk into our world with such a great story to be told of how you are working in us and through us. Help us to praise your name today, for you alone are worthy. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Church, hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Will you please stand as we call to worship? Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness 
for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Please join me in singing our opening hymn. It is number 2270, found in our small hymnal. 2270, He Has Made Me Glad. His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me It is our lost and found bin here at the church. And I was just, just curious of what people have lost. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, okay, somebody lost a big volunteer. <coughs> Wait, what's that? Oh, it's one Wakanda. A Wakanda t-shirt. Um, we have, ooh, some nice leather gloves. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're mismatched. We have a two pair of different gloves. Uh, what else? Oh, we got a water bottle. Yeah, I know, right? He's looking like, what, what is going on? So I wanted to share with you a story that's in the Bible. And it's a story about how a man had a hundred sheep. However, one sheep strayed away. They just walked away. But it was so important that that man, he found his sheep. So. He wouldn't stop looking until he found his sheep. Did you find your locket, by the way? It's like Anna. She wouldn't stop searching until she found something that was so important to her. And Hero says she lost one of her doll's clothes. Right, and it was important that you find it. Well, that's the same thing about people in the church. Not that we lose people in the church, but sometimes people don't come to church. And when they don't come to church, what is our responsibility to do? Hey, how are you? What would you say? Make sure you go to church so you can what? Amen, make sure, she said, make sure we come to church to learn about Jesus. But let me ask you this question. When somebody don't come to church, what should we do? Madison. Pray for them. Thank you, Madison. Anything else? What should we do? Any other suggestions? Yes, Wyatt. I lost a lot of trucks. Did you find them? <laughs> no. No? Okay, no. So let me give you one suggestion. When we don't see people in church, just like I ran and hugged someone today, we should maybe what? Thank you. Make sure they're okay. We should 
call them? What, what did your mother suggest to you when she said about moving that you can what? Write a, write a letter to that individual and put a, a stamp on it. So it's important that when we don't see people, when you don't see your friends in this circle, we should ask, where is so-and-so? And if we can't find them, if someone don't know, you should say, can I give them a call to make sure they're OK? Because look how many people are missing on this side. <laughs> <laughs> and so what should your parents may do, maybe do? Or what should somebody in the church may do? We should call them. We should try to connect. Why is it important? Because God loves everybody. And sometimes people can be ill and we might not know about it. Or sometimes people may be going through hard times. And it's important for the body of Christ to connect with everyone. Because why? Everyone in the church is important. All right? So let's stand up. And since I have one of my teenagers today, I'm going to give her the mic and ask her to pray for the church. Let's do a, a, a prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I want to say thank you for letting us all be here today. And I pray for the ones that didn't make it but had the heart to make it. I pray for those who made it today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Let's say our, uh, the Lord's Prayer all together. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Let's turn our hearts and minds over to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, on this cold day, we come to you and we know that we are, we are together as family, that we are together as, as a group of, of believers to celebrate life and joy. <clears throat> we heard the joys of family. We have heard the joys of, of new life coming into the world. And we give you thanks. We give you thanks that, that your hand is, is in our lives, that your presence is powerful, and that you do make great changes to our lives in such a way that we are free. We are free indeed. And so we come to you and we thank you, Lord. We also lift the names of those that we have spoken of today. We lift also those unspoken requests that we might not even be able to turn to words but we give you thanks that your Holy Spirit can take those prayers, those groanings of our hearts, and bring them to you, our Father. And so, hear our prayers. Be with those who are sick. Be with those who are grieving. Be with those who do not have all the answers in life, whether they are, are suffering from illness or depression. Lord, bring light into their circumstance. Help us to be part of that light. Help us to be part of the answers to prayer. Keep our eyes and ears open that we might see the need that is in our communities and our families. That we might encourage those who need encouragement. That we might support those who need support. That we might pray for one another that, that your glory might be shown throughout our lives and the whole world. We pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. I invite you to join me in singing our prayer hymn. Please note that the number in the bulletin is incorrect. Uh, please turn to page 381, 381, and join me in singing, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. Please stand as you are able. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, watch we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures, feed us, for our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast brought us thine Love our bosoms fill. 
be seated. Actually, at this time, before we do our scripture, I'm going to ask that the ushers come forward for the taking of our tithes and our offering. Uh, I'll let you know exactly why we're changing the order of service a little bit later, but I invite the, the ushers forward at this time. join me in singing the doxology to our Lord. Praise God from all blessings with thanksgiving that we return a portion of the gifts that you have given to us. May they be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 6 through 9. It reads as follow. On this mountain, the Lord of heavenly forces will prepare for all people a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of selected foods rich in flavor, of choice wines well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the veil that is veiling all people, the shroud enshrouding all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe tears from every face. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. They will say on that, that day, look, this is our God from whom we have waited and he has saved us. This is the Lord from whom we have waited. Let's be glad and rejoice in our salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let's take a moment for prayer. Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. And I ask that you open our eyes and, and hearts to receive what you have for us today. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite things to do with my girls is to go to the zoo. It's not a great day to go today, but we do enjoy it. We have in the past even had a zoo membership so we could go as often as possible. My girls like to see many different animals. Uh, when we go, we often go a similar path and we pass by the otters. How many people have ever seen the otters in the zoo? Has there ever been a happier animal on this earth? They are the happiest animals. They don't care that they are behind glass and sealed up. They're just out there playing. And then you go past the lions and the tigers, and they're sitting there like, oh, these people. <laughs> they are stuck behind their bars, their glass. And while the zoo has done a wonderful job giving them an environment in which to live, 
they don't look like they are the happiest animals on earth. I miss the elephants. How many people miss the elephants? Brookfield Zoo, a good, I think it's almost 10 years by now, got rid of their last elephant. When, when that elephant passed on, they did not replace it with elephants. And yes, there are many different arguments, uh, animal rights and such, but elephants are not bred for captivity. The, the, their purpose in life is not to be behind bars. And while you can keep an elephant in a zoo, while you can keep an elephant in a circus, they're meant to walk. They are designed to walk throughout the day. That is their, their purpose, to move, to continue to move uh, throughout the world. And to put one behind bars, many people say, is cruel to the animal. And the cost to make an exhibit large enough for elephants at Brookfield Zoo would be greater than they are at this time willing to invest in. And so there's no elephants at the zoo anymore. And I'm sad because I like elephants. It's, it's amazing to see something so huge. But I don't want it to be stuck where it can't fulfill its God-given purpose. Let's talk about that, being stuck, being trapped. Uh, we have, over the last few weeks, been talking about good news. We talked about what the good news meant uh, to the ancient Greeks, how it was only ever used before the gospel to talk about a military victory. Good news, we won. And so the church incorporated that phrase and gave it a new meaning. And it still had a little bit of that context. God won. But the good news means more than just a victory over some nation. And so last week we talked, or, or the week before, yes, last week we talked about what Jesus was saying when he was using the phrase good news. That God delivers us. That he can heal the lame. And that he can proclaim good news to the poor. That he can change lives. And he does still change lives today. Whether miraculously or spiritually, we are promised the good news that God can and does change lives lives. So then what did the early church mean when they were saying good news? Well, let's take a journey. First of all, we have a man named Saul. Saul was not a good guy. Saul was a man who persecuted the early church. He sought out permission to actually go to other cities and arrest People take them out of their families, get them fired from their jobs, uh, get them kicked out of their synagogues, and take them to Jerusalem to be put in prison. He's not a hero of the story until God spoke to him. This is that amazing, life-changing event that God does in us and through us, that he can turn those who are even hostile to the faith into great believers. I think about C.S. Lewis, who started as an atheist and became one of the greatest theologians in uh, recent history how he argued against the existence of God until one day he did enough research, he did enough looking that he said, wait a second, this has to be true. And so in Saul's life, it took a vision from God. And Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul is struck blind by this experience, and he calls out, Oh, uh, Lord, Lord, who are you? Who am I persecuting? And he said, I am Christ Jesus. And he gives him instructions, and he goes, and he finds deliverance, and he goes, and the blindness is removed from his eyes, and he begins to thank God, and he begins to preach no longer against the church, but for God's redemptive good news. 
And so over time, the church is a little scared. Because let's imagine someone who is hostile against the church, very hostile, not just someone who doesn't believe in God, but someone who is actively attacking the church, says, I changed my mind. Can I come into your congregation? Would you be exactly, uh, I would hope that we'd be welcoming, uh, but there'd be that, that reservation. Are they trying to trick us? Are they going to uh, make a disruption during our worship service? What is going on here? And so they were concerned about Saul. They were concerned that he was just trying to get in to entrap the church. But eventually they found out that he truly was a believer. And it was a man named Barnabas who was called by God to accept Saul into his church. And so he accepted Saul into the church of Antioch. And there for a year, Saul and Barnabas taught the church. And eventually God gave the church a directive that they were supposed to anoint Saul, now named Paul, and Barnabas to go out and to be missionaries to spread the word to many different cities. And so God has blessed them, and they begin their journey. And along the way, they go to different cities, and I want to talk about one of those stops. It's also called Antioch, which gets a little confusing. It's not the Antioch that they started in. It took me about 45 minutes into my sermon preparation before I realized that they didn't go in a circle. Uh, that there are two cities in ancient Rome named Antioch, one in Syria and one in modern-day Turkey. And so they are at this place where no one has heard the message of the gospel before. And so they are invited into the synagogue. And it is tradition when someone of notoriety comes into your synagogue to ask them to speak. They had heard about Saul. They had heard how he was part of the Sanhedrin's uh, uh, persecution of the church, and they wanted him to come in. They wanted to hear the message. So he gets there and he gives a message. And it starts out with a long uh, story as he's talking about God's promise to David. That God promised David that his kingdom would never end and that David would never see decay. And he points out, well, David died. So this promise could not have been a promise to David but to one of his descendants. And this is where we pick up in the story today. This is Acts 13, verses 32 through 41. We proclaim to you the good news, what God promised to our ancestors. He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Jesus. As it was written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. God raised Jesus from the dead, never again to be subject to death's decay. Therefore, God said, I will give to you the holy and firm promise I made to David. In another place, it is said, you will not let your holy one experience death's decay. David served God's purpose in his own generation. Then he died and was buried with his ancestors. He experienced death's decay, but the one whom God has raised up didn't experience death's decay. Therefore, brothers and sisters, know this. Through Jesus Christ, we proclaim the forgiveness of sins to you. From all these sins from which you couldn't be put in right relationship with God through Moses' law. Through Jesus, everyone who believes is put in right relationship with God. Take care that the prophet's words don't apply to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and die. I'm going to do work in your day, a work you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you. May God add a blessing to this reading of his holy word. The 
There are times in our life when we are like the otters in the zoo, where we are stuck in a situation of life, but life is good, and so we don't really care. We ignorantly go about our lives without realizing that we are stuck, we are trapped, we're just going in circles. And that's not what God has planned for us. And there's other times when we are obviously stuck, whether we are stuck by our own prisons that we have built or by those that have been imposed upon us by the sins of other people. That there are times when we are stuck and God has good news. In this passage, we hear that good news, that Jesus was raised from the dead. That that is that stamp of authenticity that his teaching is true. And his teaching was that there can be forgiveness of sins. That's the message of salvation. That's the good news that we talk about. That we are free. We are not trapped behind bars that that would keep us from being who God created us to be, that we are free. Does it mean bad things won't happen? I'm sure elephants have bad days out in the wild. Does it mean that we will receive every miracle that we ever ask for? No, we will face grief, we will face pain, we will face heartache. But the good news is that we no longer need to be trapped behind bars of our own creation. That we no longer have to be limited by the expectations put upon us by other people. That we don't have to live in shame or guilt. We are free. Are you living free? Are you embracing the good news or are you stuck somewhere in life? There are times and seasons when we cannot control the future, but we are still free. There are times in life when the world seems crazy, but God still has the four corners of the world in his hand. Yes, I know the world does not have four corners. But that promise that, that God is holding us up spiritually, that he has everything under control. And so, my brothers and sisters, I want you to live free. I want you to embrace the good news. I want you to see that that news is exciting because there have been times in my life, even since I have been a Christian, where I have been stuck and I could not get out of that swamp. I could not lift myself up by my bootstraps. It is not possible. But my brothers and sisters in faith, reminded me that those bars can't hold me back. Those bars of depression or situation or or, uh, bars of self-doubt that I don't have to live trapped. So my encouragement for you is to have your eyes open have your ears open to be sure that you are aware that if first and foremost if you feel trapped that you're talking to your brothers and sisters about it because in God's love they can and will by God's grace help you out of whatever situation it doesn't mean that all the pains of life will go away that's not the promise the promise is you can be free And if you know this freedom, if you know how God has delivered you, then share that story with those around you, even those who are in in these pews today may need to know how you have been freed by God's love and good 
news. We all need that reminder that we are free, that we are not stuck behind those cages, but that God's message is Jesus is the good news, that he has proven through his resurrection that his forgiveness is real. And that's what we celebrate today. And so today, as we come to the time of communion, and the reason why I changed the order of service is, I want this time of communion to be a time of celebration. Yes, it is a time of reflection. Yes, it is a time of sacredness. But today, I want us to celebrate the fact that when you take that bread, you are taking God's life Christ's life into your body. He has freed you. So celebrate that you are free indeed. And when you take that cup, you are taking in not only the, the symbol of Christ's death and resurrection, but you are taking that cup of forgiveness. That cup, in a way, is the key. The zookeeper doesn't get locked behind the cages because they have the key. The key is God has forgiven you. And no matter what else might happen in the future, no matter how you might fall short, no matter how other people may condemn you, you are freed by God's forgiveness. And so with that, I invite the ushers to come forward for this wonderful time of celebration, the table of the Lord's Supper. On the day before Jesus was arrested, he met with the disciples and he had the Passover meal. And as part of that meal, he took the bread and he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. Every time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we remember the sacrifice of our Lord, that he was willing to have his body broken in order that we might be made whole. It is the tradition of our church that you do not need to be a member to partake, that you do so in a worthy manner. So let us take a moment for prayer. Lord God, prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to receive this promise that we have been made whole by the sacrifice of our Lord. Help us to come closer to you. Help us to celebrate today this amazing gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Take and eat and receive that gift of life. In a similar manner, after the supper, he took the cup. And the Passover meal has several cups. That final one was the promise that the Messiah was going to come. And Jesus took the cup and he gave it a new meaning. He said, this cup is the new covenant, the new promise for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. This cup is that new promise that you are forgiven. You no longer need to live a life behind bars, that you are freed. Take and drink. After that Passover meal, the Bible says that the disciples celebrated together in song before they went out to the Mount, uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I invite us together to sing together, holding hands with those around you as we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. And I do not want to diminish anyone's journey. I do not want to say that, that it is inappropriate for you to be where you are today. But if anyone feels trapped in life's circumstances, if anyone needs to speak through where they are today, please speak with me. If this is the first time that you have ever come to the Lord, come to the Lord. If this is the hundredth time that you have come to the Lord, come to the Lord and know his freedom. Go in peace. Jason, I understand next Sunday we're going to have some special guests with us. Is that 
Is that true? The yes. Next week we have uh, Pastor Crystal. Would you like to make the announcement? It's the, second Sunday. the second Sunday. Yes, the second Sunday of February. So next week we will have uh, my husband's choir who came last year. Fellowship. So we will have. Oh, what I was hoping for was the name of the church. DuPage American Methodist Evangelical will be here, Episcopal, sorry, Episcopal will be here to help celebrate with us uh, on the Lord's Day. So next week, some wonderful music. Go in peace. <laughs>